I'd like to introduce my very good friend and former colleague, Victor Hagani. Uh, I met Victor when I joined Solomon Brothers. He was a member of the interest rate arbitrage group there. Uh, Victor then went on from there to become a founding member of Long Term Capital, uh, which is not the topic of conversation today. Um, Victor runs a wealth management company called Elm, and the Elm website is where you went to play your coin flipping game. Uh, Victor's going to talk about that and some other interesting things related to uh, risk. We'll be talking more about risk management in the second, in the last part of the course. Thank you, Victor. Okay. Hi, everybody. So I'm going to try, I, I've taught this class or talked at this class a few times. And um, today I thought that I would do something a little bit different where I really want to go far, far, far with this topic. So it's going to be a, uh, an ultra marathon. We're going to cover so much material. We're going to see what happens. It's an experiment. We might, you know, it might not make any sense to you by the end, but hopefully, um, you know, you're going to get a lot out of it and be left with some valuable tools. Um, so um, just, um, you know, I've, I've done this experiment before. I'm curious, how many people know what this is? Raise your hand if you recognize what I've got on the board there. Just a few of you, or? Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody raise your hand. Okay, all right. So we, we know what that is, right? Um, how about this? Do, you know, does this, everybody know what this is? Is it too small? No, it's nice and big. Okay. So people know what this is, right? Okay. All right. And um, I bet people know what this is, too, right? You probably know what this is as well. How about, um, I bet in this, does people know this is the Sharpe ratio, probably, right, for investments? So you guys know all that stuff, right? Who knows what this is? Raise your hand if you know what this is. Who, who's seen this formula before? Anybody? Some, somebody? No? Nobody's seen that before. How about this? What's this formula? Nice, simple one. Does anybody know what this is? Don't, you know, don't be shy if you do, even if you're the only one. Nobody. Okay, so this is what I'm talking about today, right? This is what you need to know, this stuff. You needed to know this. It would have made it much more helpful for you when you were playing the coin flipping game if you knew this, if you came prepared with this. I don't know why we don't know this. I don't know why I didn't know this you know, until, um, until it was too late. So the, uh, the first one is, uh, is a simplified version of the Kelly criterion. So it's, that's the simplified version of the Kelly criterion when um, what you win and lose are the same amounts, win a dollar, lose a dollar, but with a probability of winning P, which is greater than Q. So that's our game, actually. So that says that the Kelly criterion for our game that we played, the coin flip game, that the Kelly criterion would say bet 60% chance of win, 40% chance of loss, bet 20% on each flip, and that would, be, uh, that would be the strategy that maximizes the, um, the exponential growth rate of your bankroll. So that's like a gambling thing, but it shouldn't just be a gambling thing. And the other one is a more generalized version of that. Uh, we call it, people generally call it the Merton share, and it's more of a continuous time version of the Kelly rule, and it also is... Um, set for different levels of risk aversion. So instead of maximizing the exponential growth rate that Kelly does, this one is really about your risk preferences. If gamma in the denominator is equal to one, it actually is, uh, it maximizes your exponential growth rate and um, it's the same as Kelly. So, um, you know, what's the difference between these two sides of the slide? You know, one slide is just all about investment selection. It's all about what should we buy? What's good? What's the valuation of some options? What's the value? Uh, what's the yield of a bond? Um, and, um, but on the right side is, the, is all about the question of, of, uh, of how much do I want to invest in these things, right? So if you think about the capital asset pricing model, if you think about Tobin separation theorem, right, all this stuff is like, okay, this is all about the optimal portfolio. And once we decide what's on the efficient frontier, you know, and the, and the point of tangency, et cetera, then we say, okay, we're going to, um, now it's up to each investor to decide, to decide how much of the risk-free asset to have and how much of the, this, this risk efficient, this return risk efficient portfolio we want to have. And that second part of how much of it do we want to have, they, 
don't we don't hear that much about it. They talked about it a lot. You know, academics have talked about it a lot. They've written about it a lot. But somehow it just seems to have like, you know, not made it down into the stream that we're all drinking from. So we're going to, you know, that's that's what we're talking about uh, today uh, all together. So what to expect in this ultra marathon that we're going to do is that um, we're going to talk about a lot of stuff. I said to Simon, you know, that, that I'm happy for you guys to have the slides. You, there's a lot of um, stuff you can find to read to follow up. So, you know, if, if you're not following, uh, you know, that if I've lost you at some point, which I'm, I, I, I expect that I will, don't worry about it. You know, it's, it's here. It's simple stuff. But, you know, like you might just I might not be explaining it well or slowly enough. So. What we're going to do is we're going to start off and talk about the coin flipping exercise that we did. It's kind of fun. And then we're going to talk more generally about um, uh, sizing decisions and, um, and, and a lot about expected utility. So, um, so here was the coin flip game. Uh, thanks for um, giving us more data. <laughs> and, um, um, you know, that's what you guys did. You, it all looks familiar. So. I don't know if you guys know this or not. I don't know if Simon mentioned it, but about five or six years ago, uh, we actually went out and uh, went to people like yourselves, actually, um, smaller groups. And, and we actually had a seminar like this. And uh, I came in to talk. And I said, OK, everybody in the room gets $25. Play the game for half an hour. However much money you have at the end, we're going to pay you in cash or Venmo or whatever. and. Um, there's a maximum payout. If you get close to it, the program will tell you you're approaching the maximum payout. That maximum payout was $250. We thought in doing this experiment that we'd be paying a lot of people $250. <laughs> um, and um, um, and that's, that was an experiment that we did. We did with 61 people. We sort of had somewhat of a limited budget. Uh, and so uh, we went around you know, to different um, business schools and to some Wall Street banks and investment companies and did groups of you know, 10 people at a time or so. So exactly what you guys did, except a bit more time and for real money uh, with a 250 cap. And then we, um, we found the results so interesting that we wrote about it on SSRN. And then the Journal of Portfolio Management said, well, we'd love you guys to write this up in the journal. And, um, and actually, the article got picked up. Like, it went a bit viral at the time. So, like, the Economist and the Journal and some other places, um, you know, wrote about it. And this was the results that we had for the real. This is this real money thing that we did. Uh, and uh, you know, quite <laughs> remarkably, uh, 28, 28 percent or so of our population went bust. Basically, wound up with no money at the end. And uh, only 20 percent or so made the 250 cap. Um, if you have time, you could run a simulation and see what it looks like by following, you know, uh, any number of, of strategies. You know, there are any number of constant proportional betting strategies that will take you to a 95% chance of hitting that $250 cap. But these guys didn't do it. You know, they didn't get there. And the reason they didn't get there is because they had no idea what, what to do. They just had to, like, figure it out on the fly. There was time pressure. The exact same thing for you guys, except... You know, you had some time if you felt like it, you could have read about it or this or that. But, um, you know, it was really quite remarkable. And it really, and it really led me to uh, want to spend a lot of my time writing about and talking about and thinking about this part of household finance and finance in general, the sizing uh, decision. How much of a, of a, when you're faced with a good opportunity, how much do you put into it? Do you do what Elon Musk does? and put 150% of your wealth into three companies or not? What are the implications of that? You know, in terms of the kind of behavior that we saw in our study, you know, we saw all kinds of things. You know, people would sometimes bet on tails if they thought tails was going to come up, erratic betting, underbetting, overbetting. Um, here's you guys, more or less, although a bunch of you played it today that I didn't put into the data. Um, so you can see that, I mean, you guys weren't playing for real money, so, you know, I don't put a ton of weight on this, except for the fact that very few of you were familiar with constant proportional betting and tried different things. Some people started off just betting a dollar for a while. You know, there was a lot going on, but, you know, it wasn't for real money. And um, 
but still it's kind of, you know, looks similar to what we've seen in general. And this was last year, sort of, a, I think I have different buckets or something, you know, between these two things, a bit different buckets, but last year's class, um, uh, or maybe I was measuring things a little bit differently, because I think last year I just took how much money everybody had at the end, but this year I sort of took your maximum amount of money that you reached, and if it was above 250, I counted that, you know, et cetera. So, like, if you got bored and you just decided to bet the whole thing at the end, that didn't hurt you, and did, that didn't hurt the results in there so much. Um, so, yeah, I had a couple of really fun comments from people. I had two comments that I thought maybe you guys would like to share. You know who you are, who made these comments. I think it's okay to just say what, you know, to just put them up there. So one of them, so one of you said, uh, what would I have done differently? Um, I would have, I would bet 10% on each bet. Um, and I'd like to do some math about that, which I thought was pretty cool. But then that person went on and said, uh, if I would bet, if I could bet my own money on it, the answer is yes. And um, you know, I would just, um, I would just live in the street um, so that I could have more money to bet on this game, which I think is the full credit answer. Like whenever, if you really ever get a chance in your life to really make bets that are 60/40 with a known probability, maybe you didn't believe me when I said they were 60/40, but if you ever really get a known probability like this, it's great. I think most of you, when comparing it to the stock market talked about how, you know, in the stock market, who knows exactly what the expected return is. And then this other person, I liked how they tried to think about it quickly. It was like, okay, um, look, I got to come up with some sizing decision. If I, I, I want to survive four, four tails in a row. So I'm going to figure out the probability of four tails in a row and then sort of do my bets, um, then figure out my bets so that I'm betting less than one one fourth um, on uh, on that, but you know this person wasn't really thinking in terms of constant proportional betting because you can never lose all your money if you're doing constant proportional betting. You know you just keep going down, well until you get down to one cent. So now, so that's it. We can talk more about the coin flipping as we go along. We'll talk more about it in a second, actually. But you know the sizing decision, right? Is like there's the right size for a risk depending on its attractiveness, and if you take too little of it, you're suboptimal. If you take too much of it, you're suboptimal. You know, it's gonna it's, it's sort of a different kinds of damage happen to you. You know, overbetting. Uh, you know, I guess you know at some point overbetting is worse than underbetting, but both of them are pretty bad for you. Um, so, um, also, um, you know, here's a little bit of a simulation of constant proportional betting, uh, you know, at four different bet sizes, 5, 10, 20, and 40% of your bank, and then compared to either absolute betting of just putting $4 on each flip, or a double down betting where you just keep, if you lose, you keep doubling down. And, you know, the, outco the expected outcomes for this game were a lot better with um, the constant proportional betting, constant fractional betting in particular, somewhere between 10 and 20%. Um, so, Let's now think about being able to play this game somehow, but for real money. You know, let's say that you got a million dollars of wealth and you're allowed to play this game and you know that it's a 60-40 coin um, and you're starting, you know, and, um, and you're trying to figure out what should you do, right? So we know that um, if you bet 10% on each flip, your expected return per flip, right, is you have a 10% chance of winning 60, a 10% chance of losing 40. So that's a 2% expected return on your capital on each flip. Uh, I'm talking about doing 100 flips here. So your million dollars would be expected to grow to $7.2 million. Expected here means what? It means that we look at all the ways that you could flip 100 coins, you know, make a binomial distribution. We get a probability for what's the probability of 70 heads and 30 tails, and what's the probability of 26 heads and 74 tails? And we get all those probabilities. How much money would you have at the end if you bet 10% on each flip? Then multiply those probabilities times your payout, and that's your expected value. So you'd have $7.2 million of expected value um, if you were betting 10%. What about if you're betting 20%? Well, you're going to have a lot more. You're compounding at 4% per flip expected instead of 2%, so you'd have $51 million. Um, what do you think? Do you think if you're betting 50% on each flip, you have a higher expected value? 
13 billion dollars, <laughs> 0.8 billion dollars, and the highest expected gain, right? People, I think people don't always see this. The highest expected gain is if you just bet 100% of your money on every single flip, your expected gain is, well, it's 20% per flip, and when you compound it, it's 82.8 .8 trillion dollars. That's your expected gain. Now you might say, wait, but how is that my expected gain? How would I ever win? You know, like I have to flip, I have to flip 100 heads in a row. Yeah, you're not gonna win. You're not gonna make the money, but if you did flip 100 heads in a row, you know, you'd have, you know, 100 gazillion bazillion dollars, and that tiny, tiny probability times that is 82.8 .8 trillion dollars. So that is the highest expected value strategy, the highest expected value strategy. Would anybody in this room do that with their money? No, right? Absolutely not. So what does that mean? It means that expected value is no good. We can't make our decisions based on expected value. We can't decide what we want to do by what gives us the most expected wealth. That's not right. And we have to stop that. We have to think about what's the right objective. That's not the right objective. Well, we're going to get to what's a better objective, but in the meantime, we can just do something else a little bit to see a little bit what's going on. And we can say, let's talk about the median outcome. So if I flip a coin 100 times, a 60% chance going to land on heads, there's my median case, right, is what? My, what? my most likely case is I get 60 heads and 40 tails. That's my median case, 60 heads, 40 tails. So if I bet 10% every time and I got 60 heads and 40 tails, how much money would I have? Oh, sorry, <laughs> I was starting at the other side of the table. So I'm betting 100% of my wealth on every flip, I get 60 heads and 40 tails. How much money do I have at the end? Zero, because I got at least one tail, so I'm down. But what's interesting is if I'm betting 50% on each flip, right? Uh, it's not like I lost all my money, right? But I had 60 heads, I still had more heads than tails, I had 60 heads, 40 tails but I wind up losing 90% of my money in the median case, and we'll just look at that in a second more. If I bet 20% on every flip, my median case is $7.5 million, and then it goes down again. Uh, so if I only bet 10%, now the median outcome of money is going down. So 20% is the highest, um, it's the highest median payout. That's the Kelly rule. That's sort of how the Kelly rule is defined. Um, I'm not saying you should do that with your money. I, I don't think you should do that with your money, but that's what the Kelly rule is, so at least you know that. And so what's going on with that 50% thing? Why did I lose 90% of my money? Well, I lost 90% of my money because if I win, if I win 50% of my money, my $100 goes to 150, but then if I lose 50%, I only have $75. So every time that I go, up and down, I'm losing 25% of my money. Now, if I have a 60-40 coin, I went up 60 times and down 40 times. Well, that's good. But I went up 40 times and down 40 times, so I lost 25% on 40 of those. So I lost 25% 40 times. And then the 20 times that are left over where I went up is just not enough to save me. I'm screwed, so I'm down 97%. That's, that's an important thing to sort of bear in mind when it comes to risk. I wish we had more time to talk more about implications of that, et cetera. So now, remember, we're talking about you have a million dollars. You are allowed to bet your money uh, on this coin as much as you want. How much should you bet, right? So we talked about 20% was the, uh, gave you the highest, uh, um, the highest exponential growth rate on your money. But now we can sort of, we have to think about what are, how are we going to think about it? We sort of, we could look at a simulation of, or we could see what the statistics look like for betting different amounts. And what are we going to be thinking about? We're going to be thinking about the probability of loss, the probability of gain, the expected gain, the median gain, all of these things. And we can make a table and sort of think about all of these things. So if I'm betting 5% of my wealth on every one of these flips, um, my expected final wealth is $1.28 million. Uh, you know, it's, do I have a cursor there? No. Uh, it's, you know, it's $1.28 million in that second column of numbers at the bottom. Um, if I get, so the median, right, so I have 25 flips. 
Um, 60% of uh, 25 is 15, right? So that's the second row to the bottom. That's the median case. You know, I can see that my median is going up to the 20%, then back down. Uh, my, but, but then also the risk that I have, like if I just miss by two flips, instead of getting 15 out of 25 flips, I've now moved from 100 flips to 25 flips. If I just get two less than the 15 that I'm expecting, I'm actually losing money. Um, I'm losing a lot of money with my 20%. So I still have made more heads than tails, right? I made 13 heads, 12 tails, but I lost money with my, with my 20% betting. So, um, and I've even lost money with my 10% betting, but not too much, just 2.5%. So I'm going to look at this, and somehow I'm going to say what I want to do. I'm going to sort of you know, figure out what I want to do um, from my own reflection on, for myself and talking to people. You know, I think that people generally wind up around, one, you know, if they could bet their wealth on this, they wind up around that 10% uh, sort of number doing it this way, right? But... Um, but wouldn't it be nice to get a general rule for thinking about this stuff, right? Like more of a general rule rather than you know, just having to make some huge table and think about things every time you're faced with something. We, we want to get some sort of a, um, of a more general rule, and we'll keep getting more general rules as we talk. So, um, so th you know, in terms of a more general rule, you would say, well, look, um, uh, let's say that... Uh, just to sort of think through how this general rule would work. Let's say that for me to be uh, indifferent to uh, either not taking a gamble or taking a 50-50 gamble where I'd make or lose 10% of my wealth, right? Um, I would require a 1% of wealth side payment. So if I were facing, if somebody said, okay, you know, you've got a million dollars, here's a coin flip, you can make or lose uh, $100,000, but I'm going to give you a side payment to compensate you for taking that risk. How much of a side payment do you need to be just willing to take that risk or to be just indifferent to taking that risk versus not doing it? Let's say that you said, I need 1% to do that. You know, I'm not going to argue why the 1% is right. Let's just say it's 1% as we try to develop this general rule. Now the question is, okay, um, how much of a side payment do I re would I require logically um, to take to put 20% of my wealth exposed to a 50-50 coin flip, right? So how should I think about that? If you can get that, like you're all sort of done, like you know everything that there is to know about this stuff, kind of. <laughs> so what is that? Is it, um, it's more, right? You got to get compensated more. How much more is it? Does anybody have, you know, does anyone want to guess or whatever, like, it's got to be more. Like if you're taking twice as much risk, you got to get paid more of a side payment to do it, right? To take twice as much risk with your wealth. What would you, maybe you could sort of think it through. Like what do you think you would want to get paid for that? Um, Is it just the one percent times the standard deviation? Ah, so you might think that that's what it is, right? You might think that, well, I just want to get paid 2%, right? I'm taking twice the risk. I need to get paid 2%, right? What do you, what do you think, Con, in the back? I think the expected value of both of the options same, so you're indifferent between option one or two. That's right. Well, what do we mean though by indifferent there? So, um, so Al, what you said is is sort of what you might think until you keep thinking about it some more. So now let's say, can I equate these? Is there any way to equate these two things? How can I equate? Oh, it's going to say you go up 20% and down 20%. That's like a four times move compared to going up 10% and down 10%. So maybe take 4% side payment. Right, that's the answer. So the way to think about it, how are we going to equate these things? So I, I want to say I've got a 20%, I'm taking, 20, I'm exposing 20% or I have a 20% standard deviation on my, um, on my wealth and this one that I'm trying to figure out. Can I, can I figure out something with the smaller bet that's the same amount of risk, right? And so if you're flipping a coin, if I flip the coin twice, right, what's the standard deviation of my outcomes? So either if I flip heads, heads, I make 20% of my wealth, great. If I flip tails, tails, I lose 20% of my wealth, right? Okay. That's 20% standard deviation, but now I've got these two other cases of heads, tails, tails, heads, 
where I break even. So clearly, flipping the coin twice is less risky than flipping it once. Flipping the coin and taking 10% risk twice is less risky than flipping the coin once for 20% of my wealth. And it turns out that flipping it four times is exactly as wealthy measured in standard deviation. Flipping a 10% plus or minus, taking a 10% risk four times independent outcomes is the same risk as flipping it once for 20%. And if I showed you a little bar chart, you could kind of see it visually somewhat, right? Because now it's like, okay, well, I could get four tails in a row or four heads in a row, and that's 40%. That's terrible. But that's really unlikely, right? That's um, a 1 16th chance of either of those things happening. Uh, and then, but then I could, <laughs> but then I could get uh, three heads and one tail or three tails and one head, and that would take me to the plus or minus 20%. But then I could get two heads and two tails and break even and sort of suck in all the compensation that I was getting for not having taken any risk at the end. And that balances out. So I need to get 4% compensation for taking twice the risk. So the rule that I'm looking for, ah, that's what I just said there. Um, I'm not going to say it again. So the rule that I'm looking for is going to have variance in the denominator. It's not going to have standard deviation. It's going to have variance in the denominator. And so um, I'm just going to jump to this rule here. Um, this is one of the big jumps we're doing in our ultra marathon. And um, this um, functional form here, as we saw in you know, one of the early slides, we call it the Merton rule because Bob Merton, um, Simon's uh, um, professor, what do you call him? thesis advisor, professor. Um, Bob Merton sort of put it out there, I think, the first time. I'll have to ask him sometime or ask somebody if there was anybody that put it out there before. But we call it the, you know, it's kind of called the Merton share in this very narrow literature on this stuff. And so the, the, what it's saying is that the optimal amount of risk to take is equal to the excess expected return of your gamble or of your investment divided by the... Um, the standard deviation squared, the variance, and oh, the two here, I just threw it in to sort of, it, it shouldn't be two, it should actually be your coefficient of risk aversion, which I'm assuming is two. So if you're more risk averse, you would have a higher number down there, three or four or five. If you're less risk averse, you might have 1.5. If you put one down there instead of the two, you'd be this um, uh, exponential maximizer, Kelly kind of person. Um, I'll have to fix that slide. Um, so that's the Merton rule. Now, you need to lead this lecture with the Merton rule in here to be able to use it. So what we're going to do now is we're going to use it a couple of times. So you could see it being used because if you do that, you might remember it. Okay, so let's take an example. So we're looking at the stock market. We think that the stock market is going to the expected return of the stock market, we think it's 5% higher than risk-free assets. Might not be the case for US right now, but let's say globally, that's what it kind of looks like. And let's assume, just because it makes the numbers a bit easier, that the standard deviation of returns of the stock market is 20%. And you have a coefficient of risk aversion of two. So we could use that formula from the page before. So five, 20, and two are the numbers. So can somebody tell me how much this person would optimally invest in the stock market using this formula, right? So it's 5%, right, over 2 times 0.2 squared. Who's going to get it first? Gets a lifesaver. So a lot of people are not even trying to get it. Come on. 10%? 10%? No. I don't know who said it. I won't point the finger. 10%? No. Come on, guys. 62.5%. 62.5%. Thank you. Okay, so look at it. 5%, that's mu, the expected return. So it's 5%. Uh, and then on the denominator, we have 2 times 0.2 squared. That's 2 times 0.04. That's 0.08. 0 0.05 over 0.08 is 62.5. I will get you your mint. Um, let's do it again. What about if... The stock market risk is 10% instead of 20%, right? So stock market risk is half of 
the other case, right? So you could just get this without doing the whole calculation, or you could do the whole calculation. Who's getting the mint this time? 250%. Nice, right? So if the risk is half, because we're in variant space, if the risk is half, then you want four times as much. If the risk is tw twice as much, you want one quarter of the risk, right? It's by the square. Really important, okay? So there, just take a look at it again, right? It's really simple, 0.05 divided by gamma, which we're setting equal to two here. Gamma is your coefficient of risk aversion. We'll come to that. You get 0.05 over 0.02, half the risk, four times the optimal size. So, um, you know, here's a graphical representation of kind of what's going on. You see this nice trade out there. You're trying to decide how big to be in it, right? So the bigger that you are, the higher is your expected return. That's the black line, linear, just going up. The bigger you are, the, the, the more money you make as you get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, but there's a price of risk, right? That price of risk is related to, um, to sigma squared. It's related to the variance that you're taking on as you take more and more risk. And so the parabolic thing there is your risk-adjusted return, which is what you're trying to maximize by finding the optimal amount of, of risk, the optimal amount of the investment to take. And generally, because it's a parabola, uh, in, in, well be, in well-behaved cases, I'm giving you rules of thumb, you know, all of this can be expanded out to handle anything, but these are just for nice, uh, you know, sort of IID type of processes, etc. So in general, your optimal size is going to be between zero and where you become indifferent, where that line is going down through the, uh, the x-axis. Um, you know, and so you're going to be halfway there, and your risk-adjusted return is going to be half of um, the total expected return. What is risk-adjusted return? Risk-adjusted return is the return that you should accept without any risk that would make you equally happy as taking the risk. That's your risk-adjusted return. It's also called certainty equivalent return. It's a super important concept. If you're investing in the stock market, um, you know, you have this higher expected return, but you have a higher risk-adjusted return, a higher certainty equivalent return than you do from just being invested in risk-free assets. And you would, you know, if somebody came to you and said, or if somebody said to you, you are not allowed to invest in the stock market. Sorry, you can't invest in the stock market. You're going to be worse off because of that, and you should be willing to pay up to your risk-adjusted return to get access to invest in the stock market again. Forget about the stock market being fair or rich or anything like that. The stock market gives you an expected return. You want a certain amount of it, and you're better off because of that freedom to invest in it. Um, the cost of risk, uh, again, I'm not expecting you to, to <laughs> digest everything here, but the cost of risk turns out to be gamma times the uh, variance um, of your position size divided by two. And if we, uh, if we just wrote out um, your risk-adjusted return is your expected return, right, which is your position size times your uh, uh, expected uh, excess return mu, right, so you'd have F times mu, that's your expected return, minus this cost of risk, minus uh, the gamma times um, your, your, your risk divided by two. So that, that, would, be, um, that would be a risk-adjusted return. And if I said maximize that, then you would take the derivative of that with respect to F, your position size, and bingo, you'd get the Merton rule out of that. Um, just like that. Okay. Why are we risk averse? You know, we sort of got all the way to this point of the discussion, but why are, we, why are people risk averse? It has nothing to do, forget about behavioral economics. It has nothing to do with that stuff, okay? This, I don't know why these guys went out and talk about loss aversion, you know? Why are we risk averse? We're risk averse because the more that we get of stuff, the less, the less good it's making us feel, the more that we get of it per unit, right? We have a marginally decreasing utility, happiness, whatever, from more wealth, from more spending. 
um, you know, from more chocolate covered almonds, whatever it is, right? We have a de- you know, you know, that's normal human functioning. We have a decreasing marginal utility of wealth. This idea has been around for how long? For 500 years or 400 years. This is not Daniel Kahneman. This is, you know, fundamental economics going back to Daniel Bernoulli, the St. Petersburg paradox, people thinking about gambling. Our objective is to maximize our expected welfare, not to maximize our expected wealth. And you can see here why you've got to be risk averse, right? Because that curve is concave for normal people. The curve is concave, our utility curve on mapping wealth on the x-axis into your utility. So you can see that you've got to have, um, well, you can see that if you just make a certain, if, you make the, if you're taking a gamble where you might make or lose the same amount of wealth, your y-axis stuff, you're much worse off because you're losing more from the loss in terms of utility on the y-axis than you're making when, when you make the gain, okay? So we could have all kinds of different, you know, that's a curve. What kind of curve is it? It could be any kind of curve that's concave. Um, you know, what do we want it to do? I mean, generally, more money is better than less money, so we want it to be increasing. Uh, you know, we want it to be increasing over wealth. Uh, we want it to be concave so that we're risk averse because that makes sense. Um, and maybe we want one more feature, or maybe we don't. Maybe we want a feature that we have a constant relative risk aversion so that when we're facing the same kind of opportunity, if, if we're twice as wealthy versus half as wealthy, we want to bet twice as much on that thing when we're twice as wealthy or the same percentage amount. We want to expose the same amount of our capital to an opportunity, um, you know, sort of regardless of our wealth level. There's a lot of evidence, you know, that people, you know, uh, people's wealth has gone up a lot over the last 150 years, and we're not seeing that, um, that risk aversion has, like, dropped off dramatically as a result of that. So there's some evidence that this makes sense. It's easy to work with. You know, you could have other functions, but I like that one. That's, this, is a, um, uh, this is the functional form for constant relative risk aversion. Uh, it's also called isoelastic utility. It's also called power utility. There's other ways of writing it. This is a nice way to write it where you get, um, you know, nice um, derivatives of it as you take the derivative. And gamma here is your coefficient of risk aversion, which, you know, gen- we find that people generally are falling into this gamma equals 2 to gamma equals 3 sort of region. Um, This is what your curve would look like for different levels of gamma. The top curve that's convex would be if you're risk-seeking, which is gamma of equal to minus 1. We don't think anybody's like that. If anybody's like that, they tend to lose all their money really quickly because if you're risk-seeking, you should accept anything that anybody comes to you with. So... If you find somebody who's risk-seeking, you just say, hey, would you uh, give me positive odds on some bet? And they should say yes, because I'm risk-seeking, and they will run out of money really quickly. There's an infinite amount of um, bad risk that's available for anybody that that is risk-seeking. Risk-neutral is just about as unlikely to be found. Um, But anyway, that's what the different curves would look like. Um, So... That's a utility curve, and we're trying to make decisions that maximize our expected utility. So I talked about expected wealth earlier, right, where it's take all the probabilities, multiply it times your payout in each case, and that's your expected wealth. Your expected utility is just take all the probabilities, you have all your wealth numbers, take the utility of wealth for each of those outcomes using that, you know, using this function here, whatever you have for your gamma, and that gives you expected utility. And... This is like a magical thing. You know, it it's, takes a little while to think about it, but how can it be that this one measure tells you what you should do, right? Because, you know, maybe some other measure could tell you, you know, why is it this one tells us what to do, right? Why is it that, you know, that why isn't it like expected utility minus, minus K times expected utility squared. Maybe that's what we should be looking for. But no, it's expected utility. The simple, the simple metric encompasses everything that you need to know about a distribution of outcomes and your own preferences. Um, and it's, so it's magical. Okay, I'll leave it at that. You know, as you read more and think more, try to see the magic in there being one number 
that actually encompasses um, everything that you need to know about um, a situation. Um, this whole talk right, that I'm doing, it's, this is all about making good decisions. It's about making consistent decisions, decisions that are consistent across different opportunities, consistent across different wealth levels, and your own pref consistent with your preferences. Um, it's, I'm not trying to describe what people do. What do people do? We do crazy things. You know, we have all this literature of behavioral economics. Everybody's doing dopey things. That's not what this is about. I'm not trying to say this is what people do. People don't do this. I'm trying to tell you what people kind of ought to do, or at least they ought to do it with big sums of money in their lives, with consequential financial decisions. Like, do whatever you want with coffee money. This is about, you know, what you should do to be consistent and sensible in your, in your um, financial lives. So it's prescriptive, not descriptive. And many of the criticisms of expected utility theory are that, oh, people aren't like that. Well, fine, teach them how to be more like that, and then that's good. It's not, you know, people want a consistent framework for making decisions and not uh, the fact that we don't naturally gravitate towards that is not, I think, is not a valid criticism of it as a prescriptive uh, model. Um, so maximizing the expected utility of wealth when wealth is a random walk because you're investing in things that are random walks, that gives us the Merton share as we've already talked about. Um, there it is again. I want you guys to remember this when you leave <laughs> and have this, have this um, you know, in mind, that there is this thing and that this is what it looks like. And um, you, know, you can go on Wikipedia whenever you want and find it um, if you forget what it is. So now, here we go. So now we're going to really go some distance because now we're going to take this. So everything we've been talking about is what? is a one period case, right? It's like a coin flip, or it's 100 coin flips. But there's no time. We haven't been talking about time at all, right? But now we can actually take this and extend it out into an intertemporal framework, into a lifetime framework, and we can use it to make decisions not just about investing, but also about our spending. By thinking about how sh what should our spending policy be over our lifetime, which maximizes the utility, the sum of the utility of our lifetime. So we can break our life into years. We can look at the utility from spending from this year, the expected utility for the next year, the expected utility for the next year, and we can come up with, um, and we can come up with an optimal spending policy for our wealth over time that gives us the greatest amount of expected lifetime utility. Now we're going to. Um, you know, we'd want to discount that potentially, right? Like we might have some time preference. I didn't put it into this formula here. We might have some time preference where um, utility 10 years from now is not quite as nice as utility today. I mean, in general, it's believed that, uh, look, right now we're us. There's some future self out there that's not quite us, somebody a little bit different. So we might have a preference for us over them, even though, you know, we're sort of evolving into them, whatever. I mean, that's a whole other... A uh, lecture we could do is on time preference. We're not going to go there. Um, but this is your basic um, lifetime, um, the, the lifetime perspective on it. And so here, there would be, that, that you could see that we're trying to solve for two things, right? One of them is, how much should I invest in the risky asset or in this optimal risky asset portfolio? That's my F, my fraction. And how much should I be spending of my wealth each period? That's my uh, consumption number, my, lower, my lowercase c for consumption. So I'm trying to jointly solve for c and f that, uh, that maximize my lifetime utility. And, um, the, um, and, and it turns out that you know, there's two parts to the solution. It turns out that the first part is the portfolio choice part actually doesn't matter what my age is or anything like that, that in this simple setup, I'm right back at the Merton rule again. There it is, the Merton share for how much to have in that risky asset. So in, you know, if I have a long life or whatever, that is, well, even if I have a finite life under the uh, simplest setup of the problem, my amount that I want to invest in the risky asset is constant through time, um, which, is, which is a pretty interesting result. This is a 1960 odd paper. Um, that, that put that out there. But now I want to get into 
the, um, the spending part a little bit, and I just want you to see it. You know, I'm not, you know, I know that, you know, we're really, and if you ever saw what this looked like in the original paper, um, you know, it, 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 you can understand why it hasn't really made it into, um, um, you know, into sort of everyday discussions about finance. But you might think, like, what should, like, what should an endowment, what should an endowment spending policy is? You know, they've got a bunch of assets. They think that it's got an expected return of some amount. It's got a certain amount of risk. What should they be spending each year? Should they spend the expected return? Should they spend more than the expected return, less than the expected return? What does it depend upon? And this formula kind of tells you what it would depend upon. It would depend upon um, what's the risk-adjusted return of their portfolio, right, which we talked about already, risk-adjusted return. What's the return that you would accept to get paid with no risk uh, that would make you as well off as, uh, as owning the risky portfolio, which so the risk-adjusted return is always going to be lower than the expected return on the portfolio. And then we have a time preference number. You know, what's your time preference how much more do you value stuff happening sooner rather than later? And then there's the coefficient of risk aversion, gamma. So there's your formula there. It's really, really simple. So what are we going to do? We are going to, um, we're just going to throw some numbers in there just to see how it works. And um, you can see that if you had... Uh, a risk-adjusted return on your portfolio of, say, 5%, you have time preference of 2%, and again, we're, the whole time we're using this gamma of 2, then your optimal spending policy is spend 3.5% of your wealth um, every year. Whatever that wealth is moving to, look at it, spend 3.5%. So your spending is linked, that this, your spending has to be linked to the variability of your wealth, that these the spending and investment policies or investment risk and spending risk are linked together. They can't be, um, if, you, if you try to separate them and just spend the same amount of money every year, like don't change your spending, but let your portfolio go all over the place, you start to get a really high chance of running out of money, which is a lot of negative utility. Um, I think that's what's happened over very long periods of time to wealthy families, actually. Yeah, Pablo. Um, what's, what if, if Time is limited. Let's say it's like our lifetime savings, and we want to use all the savings in our life. Then actually, we could spend more than three point five percent, right? Right. Um, so, um, so what about um, you know what about in a finite life? I had it. I had you covered. <laughs> <laughs> so in the finite life case, um, the way to think about that is that that um, C star number, that optimal number there, the optimal spending number of three and a half percent, what you would simply do is if you knew how long you were going to live, then you would just look at your wealth and you would create an annuity using three and a half percent as the annuitization factor. So if I was going to live for 20 years, um, so if I were going to live for, um, you know, for 20 years, right, uh, and... Um, so here's my, um, you know, let's call it my long-term spending policy. Uh, what did I say? Three and a half percent, right? Oop. Um, right, so I'm just now I'm going to get my annuity value. How do I do that, right? I'm going to say the present value using three and a half percent over 20 years of a dollar payment, right? Um, so my, you know, I, I don't like it when it goes negative, but um, so, you know, so basically, um, right, so a dollar a year for 20 years discounted at three and a half percent is worth $14.21 today. So if I had wealth, let's say, of a million dollars, right, then um, I would want to, uh, I would want to spend, you know, my first year of spending would be the million divided by the 14.21, um, which is... Um, you know, also 7.04%. 7, 7 so my first year of spending would be 7.04% of my wealth. And then, you know, if I had 19 years to go, you know, when I got into the 19th year, when I had 19 years to live, I knew that I was going to die in 19 years from then, you know, then that percentage goes up to 7.3% of however much wealth I have at that point. 
maybe I only have 900,000 of wealth, so I would then, my optimal spending would be to spend 7.3 of that. When I have 10 years to go, I'm spending 12% of my wealth in that 12th year, in that uh, 11th year of the, of the thing. When I have one year to go, I spend it all because I'm dying next year. And, you know, we can easily modify this for, um, you know, for un unknown longevity as well. So we can maximize expected utility if I don't know when I'm going to die. But it's just easier. But you're still using that, um, that sort of long-term optimal consumption rate as your annuity, as your annuitization factor. Okay, let's see if I can get back here. Come on. Nice. So that's what you do for a finite lifespan. Well, that's what you do for a known finite lifespan, and then a little bit, you, you know, you wind up doing stuff numerically uh, for using a mortality table. So, um, so, so, yeah, I mean, our ultra marathon, um, we've, we've sort of got more or less to the end of the ultra marathon with a lot of time to go, although not quite there yet, but close. So I just want to give you a flavor of like questions that are only answerable um, if you have some sort of, that, that require you to put a price on risk, that require you to have a sense, that require you to have an expected utility framework that is pricing risk into your decision, right? So we've already talked about how much to invest in risky assets or in equities, right? So if equities have a 5% expected return, if you want to maximize your expected wealth, what do you do? You just invest as much as you possibly can in equities. If you can get five times leverage, go for it, because that gives you the highest expected wealth. But no, that's not what you want to do. You want to maximize your expected utility. You want to use the Merton share. Uh, it's going to be a function of the quality of the investment opportunity and your personal level of risk aversion. Um, we talked about how overinvesting, getting this decision wrong, is welfare destructive, right? So if you wind up having twice as much allocation to your risk, to your risky opportunity as would be optimal, you're in the same position as if as though that attractive opportunity didn't even exist. And if you have any more than that, you're you're destroying your welfare compared to your um, compared to doing nothing, right? So it's like not you know you could do nothing. But if you do twice as much, that's the same as doing nothing. And if you do more than twice as much, you're even worse off than doing nothing. Um, horizon. We talked about horizon and how in the Merton share um, formula, um, where's our last Merton share? Oh, well, I'm sure there's one. There it is. You know, right in the Merton share, there's no T in there, right? There's no time. Um, so... Uh, you know, if you're dealing with something that's a random walk, that's independent trials, if the stock market is more of a, uh, um, of a random walk over time, you know, then horizon actually doesn't matter. If you're a long-term investor or a medium-term investor, you still want the same exposure to equities because even though the probability of losing money is going down, the magnitude of your losses gets bigger with this random walk. And that just balances out effectively. In other words, variance grows with time, right? So the denominator is variance. Variance grows linearly with time. Standard deviation grows with the square root of time. Your expected return grows linearly with time. So you have something in the numerator that's growing linearly with time. The variance in the denominator is growing linearly with time. So the time cancels out, and horizon in the simplest world doesn't matter. Um, What's another one? Well, let's skip over number four. Number five, we talked about, you know, sort of just relating uh, Kelly betting, which you will probably, you know, hear about as you go deeper into the thing, is really just a subset, uh, is, a, is a special case of the, of the Merton criterion um, or the Merton share. Uh, we talked about the lifetime portfolio choice and consumption problem, which is a whole area of literature. I mean, I guess what I wanted to do, which I didn't really do at the beginning, because I just wanted to get into our ultramarathon, is, is, is to also give you a little bit of a sense of history of this whole area of study, because it's such a weird thing that happened. Like, this was, this was like the main thing going on in the 50s and 60s. Like, this is what all the professors and academics were thinking about. And where did it come from? I mean, it really got big with, um, 
Uh, it really got big in the 1940s with, uh, with, with a famous book and a set of results by um, von Neumann and Morgenstern uh, about game theory. And then you know, all of these well-known economists, um, you know, Milton Friedman, Paul Samuelson, um, and many others were like Ken, Kenneth Arrow. All of these guys were like right in the center of this topic of using expected utility to make decisions under uncertainty, right? That's what was all happening at that time. And it went into um, this whole field of asset pricing, like how do equities get priced? How do we price interest rates? Well, it all kind of built up from saying, imagine an individual, he has, he has a concave utility curve. Let's look at what all these people in the economy are gonna do with each other. They have some time preference, you know, et cetera. And, and all of these models got built up by looking at individual agents as being risk averse with time preference, with what they call time separable utility. So you could look at each year. And, and we built up all of these, you know, joining together the macro and the micro. This is what they were all doing back then. And then Black Shoals came along and they sort of, somebody came up with this Black Shoals formula. And, uh, and all of a sudden it was like, oh, forget about that stuff. You know, we need a gamma. We need a risk preference for that stuff. We got this other thing. We've got this Black-Scholes model. We've got this derivatives pricing. That's really great. Look at that. It's all getting used. They're all programming it up and they're using it on the floor of the options exchange, <laughs> whatever. Like this is really, really cool stuff. And somehow this other stuff just kind of got, got left to the side. And... Um, and, you know, actually, like, you know, Bob Merton, who was right in there with, with um, you know, our whole Black Shoals uh, option pricing stuff and bringing continuous time, this is what he was doing to begin with. This was his first paper as an economist at MIT was about um, the lifetime portfolio choice and consumption problem. That's what he was doing. But then it sort of, you know, went away and people haven't been that focused on it. But there was this massive literature of the whole thing. And then why is it? I don't know what, what happened along the way. Why isn't it taught as part of the basic curriculum? So yeah, if you go do a PhD in econ, you, or if you do a PhD in finance, this is it. Like you're going to know every, you're going to know all the math behind everything that we just talked about. That's what you're going to, you, you need to have all of that to understand what all these different um, asset pricing models are, et cetera. But somehow, like, we don't learn it as undergrads. We don't learn it from the media. We don't learn it in personal finance books. There's not one personal finance book that you can buy that goes into this stuff. You know, it's just all, well, you know, just do whatever. You know, like, basically, you know, figure out how much equities you want somehow. And then people say, oh, just decide on how much equities you want and never change that. Does that even make any sense? I mean, if the expected return and risk of equities is changing over time, why wouldn't you change your asset allocation over time? Why would you just say, I'm just going to be 70% in equities for the rest of my life because, uh, because why? You know, because, uh, you know, that's just the simplest thing to do. It's, it's, it's um, yeah, it's, it's sort of uh, very disappointing. Um, that's question number seven, you know, is like, is market timing, is changing your asset allocation a bad thing to do? No, you need to respond to how expected returns and risk are changing. Um, we talked about how much would you need to be paid to forego or to be allowed to invest in the equity market. You know, I think that's a really important thing to sort of think about. You know, we don't think about it like this. Like people are, around, oh, is the equity market fair? What does fair mean? Fair, fair kind of sounds like, well, Nobody cares. It's fair. No, when it's fair, it's great. You know, I mean, or whatever it is, it's great because we have the opportunity to invest as much as we want in the equity market, depending on what it's offering us. Um, number number ten. You know, like we need this to make decisions around taxes. You guys probably are not having much taxes to pay, so that's okay. Um, and um, you know, we can use it for all kinds. So. You know, we've been talking about it, you know, with regard to like investing in equities and assuming that equities are all well behaved. But you can use this for any kind of nonlinear, crazy type of investment that comes up. You can use it for deciding on, you know, if you, if you think that a Powerball lottery ticket is undervalued, you can decide, use this to decide how much should you invest in the lottery ticket. Um, very little is the answer. Um, 
you know, if you, uh, I don't know how many of you guys followed that whole uh, uh, Mayweather, O'Connor, what was his name, O'Connor or Gregor? Mayweather, McGregor, McGregor who, who followed that whole fight, that whole thing a few years ago. Like you could have decided how much to bet on that based on that, based on your own view of what the odds really were. Um, so, um, you know, a few rules of thumb. Uh, I'm just going to sort of leave this, you know, I, I have this in the deck just so you can sort of take it away. We had it around there. You've got a utility function. You can put that into a spreadsheet, uh, you know, to, to look at, you could, to figure things out, you know, just do, uh, use the solver in Excel to maximize your, the expected utility over whatever you're trying to decide on. Um, we've got the price of risk formula there, um, et cetera. So, um, the, um, the book on the left is in print. Um, it's a big, thick thing. It's got a bunch of articles in it. It's pretty inexpensive. Um, and it's a great thing. Like, if you have that on your coffee table and anybody comes around um, that's, like, into finance, they'll be really, really impressed. And, um, <laughs> and the book on the right is a book I'm working on right now. Hopefully it's going to come out in a year or so. Um, and, you know, it's going to talk about a lot of the stuff that we talked about in today's uh, talk. Um, so stay tuned for that in a year or so. And, um, yeah, I guess, uh, wow. What are we think? We're finishing at four, right? Wow, amazing. So I, I, I know that was a lot, a lot, a lot of, of stuff. And, um, but it's really simple stuff, too. Um, you know, just when you start to spend time getting familiar with it. Um, and it's really, really important, you know, that just... You know, all that we are inundated with is like, what should you buy? What should you go short? What's going up? What's going down? What's good? What's bad? And that's all important. But if you think about it, right, the how much decision, right? Like, imagine that I just don't know what I'm doing, you know, with investing. Like, I'm just making all kinds of bad decisions, but I'm getting the sizing right. Well, yeah, it's not going to be great. I'm not going to be making money. I'm going to be losing money, right? But... I'm going to sort of be okay. I'm going to survive. I'm going to have to cut my spending back, but I'm going to be whatever. But what if I find the best investments? I actually identify the best investments that are out there that all have these really high expected returns, you know, that are like underpriced by the market. But if I get my sizing wrong, if I own too much of those things, I will go bust with 100%. I can go bust with 100% probability virtually, right? I mean, it's like betting all my money. I got a 60-40 coin flip, and I say, oh, I'm just going to bet 100% of my wealth on that every time because I can and because it's the highest expected value for my wealth, and I'm virtually guaranteed to go bust, right? So you can see these two decisions, really, the more critical one is getting the sizing right. Now, we might be often protected by, from getting the sizing wrong, uh, by not being able to take as much risk as we might wrongly want to do, but that's not even the case anymore. I mean, these days you can go out and lose all your money pretty easily. You know, you can go out and just go out and buy some short dated out of the money options or whatever. You could do all kinds of things um, to take too much risk and, and to lose all your money. Um, and I think that's the more critical thing to get right. I mean, a lot of, and it's the easier thing. It's much easier to figure out how much to do than it is to figure out what's good to invest in. Like figuring out what's undervalued, you're competing with everybody to figure out what's undervalued, what's overvalued. Who knows? You know, like you have no chance really of doing that, but you can try. That's really hard. But figuring out what's the right amount of risk to take, you know, based on some assumptions is much easier. You're not competing against anybody. It's not zero sum. You're just trying to do what's good for you. So you've got to get that right. And it goes into lots and lots of uh, areas of, of your life. So stop there and uh, I hope there are some questions. Thomas, yeah. Yeah, so going back to the merchant share formula, uh, I struggle to understand how you can know the market risk premium because in my, to my understanding it's a backward looking variable because usually it's calculated as how by how much the market outperformed bonds or something like that, right? But I mean, if you're thinking about future investment decision and how much capital you're allocating in equities now, should you still look at, you know, the risk premium in people calculated, it, you know? So that, so the, so right, so the, that, you know, what you need to put into that formula is the prospective, is the future looking expected return. And where do you get that number from? 
I like to get that number really just thinking about the future without that much regard to the past. So, you know, people can debate what's the best forecast for the expected return of the stock market relative to a safe asset. What I like to do is I like to look at the cyclically adjusted earnings yield of the equity market. So let's say the cyclically adjusted earnings yield, it's the last 10 years of earnings for the index, inflation adjusted divided by today's price of the index. That's your earnings yield, and I like that as a forecast for the real, the inflation adjusted expected return of the stock market. Why do I think that's a good estimate for that? Well, it's sort of like saying, well, you know, if the company, if all the companies in the stock, in this broad stock market index, not individual stocks, but broad with everything sort of balancing out somewhat, if all the companies paid out 100% of their earnings every year, could they keep growing their earnings with inflation? I think they could. I don't think they could grow earnings faster than inflation necessarily, but I think they could keep earnings growing with inflation, just raise prices of their stuff when they need to, like all of their inputs and outputs go up with inflation. So that's, an, that's, an, that's a decent forecast uh, of the long-term real expected return of the stock market. Then I would subtract out my risk-free asset, so government, the real interest rate on government bonds, the yield on tips, on long-term tips, and that gives me my mu. That gives me my, um, my expected risk premium. But, you know, that's a, you know, uh, different people will go about that differently. You could have a dividend growth model that you could use. You could just look at history and sort of think about, you know, like, I don't like to look at history, but other people might like that the most. They might say, well... You know, stocks have earned 6% above treasury bills for the last 120 years, but, you know, maybe it's going to be lower than that going forward. Maybe it's going to be 5% or 4%. So there's uncertainty around that. You know, there's, we don't know. It's not like, it's not like I've got a, a random number generator that will make a 60% chance of that coin coming up heads. So it's not the same as that, but... You know, it, it, it turns out, actually, that, is, that if you don't think there's a bias in your estimate, that the fact that you don't know what the mean is, you don't know, you know, you know that there's some mean out there. You can't observe it. Um, so you, you, you can, you'll never observe it. You're estimating it. Okay? You know that it's not very likely to actually be the true mean of the distribution. But it actually doesn't matter that much. Uh, that parameter uncertainty does not matter that much. In, in fact, there's a whole interesting topic on parameter uncertainty of Ellsberg and urns and colored balls and all of that. Like, it's sort of like saying, like, should you really, like, if I said to you, like, if I said to you, hey, here's an urn, and I put 50 red balls in here and 50 white balls, okay? And I shook it all up. And that's, that's urn A. And urn B over here, I'm not going to tell you how many. There's 100 balls in there, but it could be 100 red balls and no white balls. It could be 60 or 40, whatever. I'm not going to tell you what's in there, but there's 100 balls in there, and they're red and white. They could be anything. And now you have, and you're going to win a prize if you pull out a red ball, let's say, Right? which of those two urns would you want to pull from, right? So you might, most people say, I want to pull from this urn here because I know it's 50-50, and I don't know what this one is. It could be 100-0 or it could be 0-100. But actually, your expected gain is the same, in fact, between the two. And, um, you know, it's a, and, and so that's sort of an example of where parameter uncertainty doesn't, isn't nice to have, but it actually doesn't make much of a difference. So... Eduardo. Yeah. Uh, I'm just curious, uh, in terms of better financial decisions, how do you think about allocating, allocating capital in terms of investing? Um, do you like dollar cost averaging, or what, what would you recommend for a regular person? Uh, you know, like, well, um, you know, if you're trying to maximize expected utility, then you just, you know, come in and decide what's the best thing to do, and, and you do it. So dollar cost averaging isn't really an optimal thing to do, but what you, what you also find with using expected utility to make your decisions, right, is that we're talking about parabolas, right? So when you're talking about parabolas, the nice thing about parabolas is that they're not like this. This is not a parabola. That's like a mountain peak. Parabolas are like that. So all around that top part, they're flat. 
So you start to do things that are suboptimal. If you're suboptimal by a little bit, it doesn't matter. You're, in, you're flat up there. So you dollar cost average, what you, and you can do your calculations. You can quantify it. You know, I'm, I'm just saying the way it turns out. You can quantify it, and you can see, I want to do something that I'm just a little bit more comfortable with. I want to do some dollar cost averaging. I'm going to feel better. What is the cost of doing that? Oh, it's a little bit. Okay, I'm going to do it because it's just a little bit. You can quantify suboptimal behavior, which is great. You know, I mean, there's also this whole idea of uh, what do they call it? Uh, there's there's this say there's this saying that this is from the military or something like um, like something like "wump left," you know, which is basically saying like if you're going to miss, miss on the left. You know, in terms of a risky decision. You know, try to miss left, don't miss right. Because remember that other chart that I had, it goes, you know, it's symmetrical like that, and then it just goes all the way down there, but you, right? So it's like when you start to miss on the right, um, it's, you know, you, you are getting closer to a cliff. Um, so if you're going to miss, maybe miss a little bit left. Um, and dollar cost averaging is like that. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, just uh, speaking about, about the game, uh, and the uh, quantity. Yeah, yeah. So I wonder, because the difference that time makes, because uh, you mentioned the one example in the paper, it was uh, there all the participants they had uh, half an hour of time. Half now, an hour. Yeah, and now we only had 10 minutes. Okay, maybe they had a difference, like still 10 minutes is quite long and uh, you can, you can uh, toss the coin quite often. But let's say it will be like 10 seconds, and like 30 minutes. Because uh, if we have, uh, so if, if, uh, if the utility curve um, so, um, if the utility gains are decreasing, the more money we have, would you say that, like, if the time horizon is very short, we would should bet less? Because, uh, like, as we could see in the one thing, so if we would win 13 out of 25 times, it would be better to to bet 10 percent than than like 20 percent. But if if we have a very long time horizon, uh, like by the uh, by the law of the large numbers, over time, like it will really be around 60-40. So then we should probably bet like the optimal amount, but if it is a very short time horizon, and if you're risk averse, wouldn't it be better to bet a small amount, let's say 10% or 5%? So, um, did every, could everybody kind of hear that? What, so so the, ga the, game is, the game is not a good representation of life, because what do you guys care about, 25 bucks or 250 bucks, right? I assume that you know, all of you have blown $250 recently on some stupid thing. So, so like, so it's a bad, you know, it's not a good game in terms of expected utility. Um, because, because $25 and $250 is like, is, is not, um, is, is, is so small that it's not affecting your, your utility really. It's not moving the needle. Like all of you guys have millions of dollars of human capital. We haven't even talked about human capital and all of this, but you guys, you know, so, so therefore, the game is not a good example of expected utility of of, an, of a real expected utility situation. So if you only had one flip, <clears throat> if you only could do one flip, I would say that what would be optimal for you would be to bet um, well to bet all your twenty. Well, the most you can do is bet twenty five dollars anyway. Like if you only had one flip, you should bet twenty five dollars. If you had a thousand flips, right? And you know that I'm not going to pay you some ridiculously large amount of money. Like you could, I told you there's a cap, so you can kind of guess like what could the cap be? What what cap would this guy do? Right? It's going to be something relatively small. You might guess it's only fifty dollars or hundred dollars. Okay, it was two fifty. So you say okay, it's, there's a cap. Maybe it's five hundred dollars, two fifty. I have a thousand flips. You bet really small because you just want to maximize your chance of hitting the cap. So it's not a good game for life. Um, you know, it's more of an expect, it's truly more of an expected value game. But the fact that like constant proportional betting, it's more of an illustration. Um, it's more, it's, it, it illustrates some things, but it's not a good expected utility uh, example because it's not material. It's not material sums of money. But uh, yeah, so the strategy, there's actually like a, the optimal strategy really is like you're betting, depending on how much time you have, you're betting. And as you start to run out of time, you bet bigger and bigger because you just want to try to maximize your chance of getting there. That's not something you should do with, you know, with, with real money. Um, not, am I missing anybody over on this side? I keep feeling like I've got my head turned there. But anyway, yeah, please. Uh, thank you uh, again. I, I was just wondering, could you go a little bit more in depth on why 
um, dollar cost averaging is suboptimal. I'm, I'm just not super clear on that. Okay. So, <clears throat> so what dollar cost averaging would be is um, that um, uh, you just got your bonus um, and you got a million dollars and um, and um, you know you're you're and and you decide okay what do I want to invest in the stock market so you say okay I'm going to use the Merton share rule my expectation of mu and sigma and my risk aversion are these numbers so I want to invest you know six hundred and fifty thousand let's say of that million dollars in the stock market so now what should you do should you just do it right away or should you say okay I'm going to invest a hundred thousand dollars per week over the next six weeks and the 25, whatever, and a little bit, rest of it after that. So should I spread it out over six weeks or should I just do it right now? You should do it right now, you know, because that's, that's a higher, you know, that's, that, that's, that's what I meant. So assuming you dollar cost average with every, say, like, paycheck you get, that's not suboptimal, right? Like, with every paycheck you get? Yeah, I wouldn't call that dollar cost averaging, really. Okay. You know, like the dollar cost averaging... You know, I mean, who knows what these things are always, you know, there's like, but, you know, I mean, I think of dollar cost averaging more as I want to do this, but I just don't want to do it all at once. I want to spread it out, even though I really know I should do this right now. That's how I think about it. And, um, you know, I think the analysis that people do of it, like in personal finance things, is a little bit off. Um, but, yeah, if you're just getting your paycheck, it's like, hey, I got my paycheck, I'm investing like that to me is not dollar cost averaging. You're you're doing what's optimal at that. You know, just do what's optimal at every moment in time, which actually is kind of a nice thing to do in general. You forget like whatever you can do, you just do it. You forget about it. You move on. And when it comes to investing in the stock market, like you have to you have to be able to put yourself into the future and realize that ten years from now you won't remember anything about anything that happened ten years ago. You know, and so you just do what's right through time, and it all kind of, you know, go, goes along like that. Um, any more? One more. Oh, excellent. Uh, so, uh, thank you for coming. I was wondering if I could ask, uh, what type of uh, investment opportunities uh, that are available for non-professional investors that are not in the betting markets are most similar to the 60-40 coin flip game? <laughs> <laughs> um, <coughs> well, you know, that, I mean, remember, like, if you, if you, you know, the 60-40 coin flip game, right, that is, when you've done 50 flips, what does that distribution look like? It's a normal distribution. It's not discrete anymore. So one of, so we ask a question in the coin flip uh, post-mortem, you know, like, do you think it's like investing in the stock market? What do you think? And most people say, well, it's a little bit like investing in the stock market, but this thing is discrete. The stock market is continuous. Well, you know, not so much. I mean, this is, you know, this starts to become continuous with lots of flips. It looks like that. This game, you have a known expected return. In the stock market, we don't know. We talked about an estimate, but we know that's not a good estimate. It's a bad, it's a noisy forecast, but it's still an estimate. And we don't know what the risk is either. And the risk in the stock market is not normally distributed as the coin flips. You do 100 coin flips, you have a nice distribution. Nobody knows what the tails of the stock market are. However, having said all of that, um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, to me, I just am really focused on, I just think the stock market is a good place to invest in. But maybe there's a better answer for you if I thought about it more. I mean, there are these things that come along. I mean, there's a lot of unscalable good investment opportunities in the world out there. They take some of your time. They're unscalable. You know, they're small. Um, but they have really nicely quantifiable returns, but they're not scalable. So when you're in a situation where you have a couple hundred thousand dollars, you can, you know, and you're paying attention, there's like good things to do to earn good returns. If you have $10 million, you know, they start to not be there anymore. And, you know, there's like, but, but there are these good, small, non-scalable opportunities to earn high quality returns on small amounts of money. Um, so, but... Like even to talk about one of them would take a while.